here on absorption, we're going to talk about getting to measuring absorption. Okay, how many people have measured absorption in a spectrophotometer? Okay, a couple, good. How about with an AC meter, like an AC9 or an ACS? Okay, a couple there. Good, okay. For those of you who've measured with a spectrophotometer, we're going to start with that. Um, how many of you could derive all of the equations of what you're measuring and what it means and how you interpret it? Right, because it's not straightforward, right? So we're gonna, <laughs> so we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about how you get from this benchtop instrument to something that we're interested in measuring. Okay, so in class and in lab, we'll talk about in situ meters. Um, we're going to focus on the AC meters, the wet labs AC meters. Um, I have a Turner ICAM, and if anyone would like to, which is an integrating cavity absorption meter, it's recently commercialized. If anyone would like to come and talk to, with me about it, um, I'm happy to do that and share my experience, but it's not really worth the class time. Uh, we will also be talking about laboratory spectrophotometry, <coughs> making measurements in cuvettes and on filter pads. And we'll show you sort of the latest and greatest in terms of, of um, approaches and protocols. Okay, so let's, we talked yesterday about what absorption means sort of at that molecular level in terms of um, electronic states and vibrational states. But now let's sort of move bigger to where we have some material that has, is comprised of a bunch of, of, uh, of molecules. And we want to consider a thin slab of this material. Okay, so my material of interest is water. So it's blue, even though it doesn't look blue if it was this thin, but just so you know. Okay, so when you think about thin, what does thin mean? You know, because we're, we're going to be talking about derivatives. So everything is sort of infinitesimally small uh, when you get to the limit of thickness. But what do we mean by thin optically? And the way that I think about it is that if we're going to pass some photons through here and measure the loss of those photons, we really want to have a probability that there's sort of one event for that photon. It can either be transmitted, it can be absorbed, or it can be scattered. But it can't be scattered and then absorbed because that would be two events, okay? Um, and you also want it to be thin enough that um, no event is shaded from another. For example, you don't want two absorbing molecules in the path so that if it gets absorbed by the first one, the second one never sees that photon, never had the opportunity for the probability of absorption. So no shading. Okay? Does that make sense? So that's thin. All right, so now let's imagine that we have some light incident on this thin slab of water and all of its absorbing materials. And we have some transmitted power. Um, now, if those two are equal, obviously, there's no attenuation, right? So that's easy. Um, but if, there's, if the transmitted radiant, um, radiant power is less, then there's some sort of attenuation. And it can either be absorbed which we're going to call sub A, and it could be scattered, okay. sub B, because B just invokes the word scattering, as we determined yesterday, right? Okay, or there could be a material in there that both absorbs and scatters. Okay. So what do we know about the power on this side and the power on this side? How are they related? They're conserved, right? What comes in must go out. And I'm, I'm ignoring, um, well, actually, doesn't I don't have to ignore it because it would be absorbed. So we can sum up those three, and they have to equal that one, and that's just conservation. Okay. So that's really helpful. That's what helps us get to the point where we can make some <coughs> sense of this. So, so now let's think about, because today's absorption, let's think about a, a material that this lab only absorbs. We're gonna ignore scattering. Scattering's for, I don't know, Thursday or something. So we can define 
that fraction of the total incident power that's absorbed as the absorptance. Okay. Absorptance. So one of the problems that you'll find if you look anything up on the internet <laughs> is that there are a lot of terms that people throw around. Absorptance, absorb, absorb tense, which I think is just a made up word. <laughs> Absorbance, absorption, absorption factor, absorption coefficient, optical density. So this is absorptance. It's just the fraction. So um, what's the range on absorptance in terms of values? Zero to one, right? No absorptance, 100% absorptance. So the other problem is that there's only so many A's in the alphabet. And so we're going to call this one capital A bold because I get to. <laughs> okay. You'll find it called everything else. But we're going to get to absorbance, which is also capital A. But I'm just not going to bold that one. Okay, so and you see our handouts, you'll see that one is bolded and one isn't. Um, I would use alpha, but alpha has a different meaning. And I would use small a, but small a has a different meaning. And so because we don't end up using this one too much, but that it's, it's a little more intuitive, I'm saving this term with the bold. Okay, so you just have to go with me there. All right. So it's the um, absorbed radiant power over the incident radiant power. All right. Well, but we can't measure the absorbed radiant power, right? You can't measure something that's gone. Well, there's ways you can measure it with heat, but, but essentially you can't measure that. So we're going to measure it by saying, if I look at the difference between transmitted and incident, what's lost is absorbed. So that's pretty easy. So then, and that's actually if there's no scattering, right? You can see where we'll be headed on Thursday when we have to include scattering. But right now, if there's no scattering, we can make this assumption that everything that's lost is absorbed. So then we're going to define the absorption coefficient. And the absorption coefficient, which is the small a, has units f per meter because it's the absorptance per unit distance. And so what we're looking at here is the distance across this slab. It's the, uh, the fraction of light that is lost per unit thickness of slab. That seems pretty straightforward, because we could measure this if we could measure a slab, a thin slab. So if we think about what that, excuse me, what that means in terms of um, taking things into a limit, we could think of this term as being what radiant power was lost over that slab, or what is the change in radiant power across this slab? Well, the change, of course, is negative because it's lost, okay? So we have a negative sign. And we, because we're talking about an infinitesimally small slab, we can say that it's the loss over the radiant, radiant power that's in that slab. And so, of course, then we see these nice deltas, so that makes us think about something. But I want you to think about this in a little bit different way. I'm going to rearrange this equation for a second. And I'm going to bring this term over here, and I'm going to bring the x over and bring this over, right? I'm just kind of doing this, right? And so what this says is, the change in radiant power over that slab is proportional to the radiant power incident on the slab. In fact, this is linearly related to this by some constant, and we're just calling that constant A. So what that, do you have a question? Yeah, what, what is it with a subscript? <coughs> It's, it's indicating that this is small enough that we can just take the, the radiance that's there, the radiant power that's there. Now, what this means is that 
the loss of radiant power over that slab is proportional to how much light is incident on it. So if you have a lot of light coming in here, the loss over this distance is going to be big. And if you don't have very much light incident on here, the loss is going to be small. So the loss is proportional to how much light is there. Well, Wait, this is not the way I want to do this. I want to do it this way. If we think about this in the ocean, how does light change with depth? Yep, the universal symbol for exponential. <laughs> right? You can measure this and people do measure it. And you guys will measure it here. So if we look at what that sort of, take a thin slab at first. Oh, I've got colors. Okay, I'll start with this one. I can sort of estimate the gradient, right? The loss. Per some unit depth between here and here, there's a pretty strong slope. If I go down to the next increment, if I've drawn my exponential right, The slope of that, of the, if you approximated the decrease in light with depth over a relatively small depth interval, and you approximated it by a linear, um, by a line, you would see that for each increment, the slope is changing as you go deeper. The slope changes as the intensity of light changes. Steeper slope, when you have more light, flatter slope, well, steeper, steeper slope here, flatter slope here, because we're in depth. And so that changes proportional to the intensity of light, which is exactly what this equation says. The loss of light through that slab is proportional to the amount of light. Okay. And that's what Lambert found in 1760 when he started the Lambert's Law. Okay. You've probably heard of Lambert's Beer Law. They were both working independently to put it together. But this is this contribution, which says that we observe, we observe this, and so we can express it this way. Okay. Okay, so I'm still up here. Okay, so now let's take the limit and allow this to go to zero. And that just screams integrate. Okay, so we're gonna integrate the absorption over dx, and we're gonna integrate the the gradient over um, the radiant power from zero to x. And so we're integrating across this slab. Okay, well this one's easy. The integ integral of a dx over x. <coughs> Ax, yeah. This one's harder. One over something is the natural log, right? And then we're gonna evaluate from zero to x. Okay, so this one's easy. Ax evaluated from zero to x is gonna give us just Ax, okay. Um, this one is going to give us the natural log of the radiant power at x minus the natural log of the radiant power at zero. X, the radiant power at zero, the radiant power at x. Okay, but there's a negative of a negative. And it's the negatives of natural logs. Does anyone remember? I think I go to the next page. Yeah. Oh, and I didn't animate it in. Okay. If you have the difference of natural logs, do you remember what that is? Mm 
It's the fraction. So the natural log of one thing minus the natural log of another thing is this over, the natural log of this over this. So that brings us to right here, right? And we still have this negative sign out front. Okay. So then we can actually bring the x over here to solve for a. And the units on this, do we have units on this? Nope, it's a ratio. Units on x will be length, meters. And so we get absorption per meter is equal to 1 over the distance times the natural log of the ratio of the measure transmitted radiant power to the incident radiant power. And that is the absorption coefficient. Okay. So this provides us with a little bit of a guide of how we're going to make measurements of absorption in the lab. Right? If we know this, and we measure this, well, we have to measure both of them, actually, because this is not constant. So you have to measure what's incident and measure what's transmitted. And you have to know that geometric distance of your sample. And you can calculate the absorption coefficient. Cool. Is that a italic lowercase a? That can be any kind of a you want it to be, right. because there's not in this lecture, anyway, any other use of A. And you'll notice that when I get to area, I'm going to use S for surface, because there's, a no, there's too many A's. Yeah. yeah, we need a whole other alphabet, because the Greek is used for other things. Did you have a question? No? Any questions on this? Yeah, just the, so the delta phi, so this is the power, but it's, bad, it's within the limit of it being really small, so mm -hmm. but, it's, but it still resembles, since there's no scattering, it's the incoming minus the outgoing? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if it was wider... Oh, we're getting there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because we can't do this. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to try to do this today. Um, we're actually going to measure CDOM absorption in a cuvette that is going to be an analog for this. And I have cuvettes that are 10 centimeters long, 5 centimeters long, 2 centimeters long, 1 centimeter long, half a centimeter, 2 millimeters, and 1 millimeter. So I will say the 1 millimeter is a pretty good approximation of this, but can we resolve the signal? Like, it really depends. So, but we can take this to a pretty small limit. Okay, um, all right, so. So now we see how we can think about absorption on a molecular level. We just looked at how you can think about absorption in an infinitesimally small layer of material. And I wanna think a little bit about particles and by the color of my particle, you know what particle I'm thinking of, right? Ivana just talked about it, phytoplankton, right? They don't look like this, but we're going to imagine that they do. They have all sorts of internal organelles, but we're going to imagine that it's a homogeneous absorbing sphere. Does all phytoplankton look like that? If she's gone, it doesn't have to hear this. Okay. So that's the equation for measuring absorption. So what I want to think about is... I'm sorry, I just keep rearranging this, but just you have to go with me on this. Okay, we're rearranging this equation. And we're going to solve for how radiant power gets transmitted through the cell. And so we can um, raise this to the power of E on both sides to get rid of the natural log on this side. And we see there's the exponential of absorption that defines that exponential decay of light. And so we can say that the radiant power as we pass through this particle at any distance through this particle is proportional to the amount that was incident on the particle exponentially decaying with distance through the particle. Okay. So here we were talking about the ocean. We could flip this on its side and it would look like the decay of light through the particle. Okay. So and I'm going to apologize for my cartoon skills 
in PowerPoint, but I used a ruler. Like I literally pasted a ruler in here to do this. Okay, so there's your wavelength of light. <laughs> okay, and you know here's the here's the uh, crest to crest or trough to trough is the wavelength of light. This one happens to be large relative to the particle. We're not talking about that right now. This is purely for schematic reasons. So we have light traveling through a vacuum. It's going to enter into this particle and we're going to ignore index of refraction which would change, which would uh, impact scattering and cause this light to slow down. That again is for Thursday when we talk about scattering. So we're ignoring scattering. I want you to think for a minute about what is going to happen to this wavelength of light as it enters into this particle. And I want you to sketch it. I want you to draw what this wavelength, what this wavelength of light looks like. Go ahead. Ignore. Ignore scattering. There's no refraction. There's no slowing down. We're going to assume that the material has the same real index of refraction. It's just the imaginary index of refraction. It's just absorption. So go ahead and sketch it. And whoever thinks they have the best sketch, just hold it up for me to look at. It's hard to sketch. <laughs> if you feel like you're stuck, you are welcome to talk with anyone. Oh, I can't get around this. Anyone want to take a chance? You have reduced amplitude? Okay, so by the time I get over here, what does it look like? It's lower. So there should be reduced amplitude, right? Because the amplitude is proportional to the amount of energy. And if you're absorbing energy, you're reducing the amount of energy. And so you have to reduce the amplitude. What happens to the wavelength? Stay the same. Some people say, anyone say larger, smaller, just right, Goldilocks, just right, stay the same. How does the amplitude change? Exponentially. So that's how I drew it. So it decreases exponentially through that material. And so, if you want to do this, you can actually edit your wave in PowerPoint and squish it down like that. It's a real pain in the neck. But I think it's very illustrative, right? You can really see how that happens. You can really see what is happening to the light in the cell, right? And then, of course, on the other side, what we measure, same wavelength. It doesn't look like it, but it is because I measured it. It's just a reduced amplitude, and then it goes on its merry way keeping its amplitude the same. Okay. Yes? Yes. So if this cell had a different real part of the index of refraction, that would slow the wave down. And in this case, since it's coming in at a 90 degree angle, it would just slow it down and then it would speed it up. If it came in at an angle, it would actually refract. And we'll get there. <laughs> 
But right now, because I've told you that there's no change in index of refraction, you can just assume that there's no slowing down and no change of wavelength in the particle. But only true for particles that have an index of refraction that matches the medium that they're in. That's the only time that happens. And, you know, for many, for many, I would say that phytoplankton tend to have they're, they're big sacks of water, right? So their index of refraction isn't tremendously different than the medium that they're in, but enough that they do have some scattering response. Excellent. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. All right. So if I have two cells that are exactly the same, except one has a lot more pigment, why might it have more pigment? less light. And phytoplankton respond to less light by, by increasing their absorption potential, by increasing the amount of pigments in their cell so that they can take advantage of the low light environment. So the, what that would look like is that you would have a much stronger decay to the point where maybe no light makes it out. Or a little tiny, tiny bit of light. What if I have two cells that are the same, or the same internal concentration, but one is bigger? If I take this exponential curves and I just make it longer, they eventually can also go almost to zero. And no light would come out. So you can think about these scenarios in the ocean. Cells of the same size that have different pigment concentrations, cells of the same pigment concentration that have different sizes. Okay. So here's an absorption spectrum from blue to red. And here's a cell, a single cell, but with two different wavelengths of light impinging on it blue light and yellow light. So the blue light is going to be here, and the yellow light is going to be here. Sketch for me the difference in how this light interacts with this particular cell for those two wavelengths. Ready, go. And you can talk if you want. Yeah, yeah, this isn't up here by accident. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the blue is right there at that peak, chlorophyll peak of absorption, and then the yellow is over here, right here at the minimum. And if you finish that, go ahead and do it for all the wavelengths. <laughs> All right, what do you think? The, the amplitude of the blue is going to decrease faster. Yeah, exactly. So if we look at the blue, it's going to have a pretty strong decrease. And if we look at the yellow, 
it's not going to have a very big decrease. And so you could imagine where you could get to a point where you could lose almost all your light here, right, depending upon how thick this is. And um, you could also imagine that um, if you looked at a wavelength just a little bit shorter or longer than this, if it was a really big cell, you could probably have almost no light coming out from any of those wavelengths, even though we know that there's probably a different efficiency of absorption, a different exponential. If you get to the point where you're at this limit where not very much light comes out, you might not be able to resolve that peak. What would it look like? Yeah, it would be flat, right? Because you're, sort of, you're at this limit, and so you end up with some flattened peaks because you have so much absorption relative to the size of the particle. I, I think part of the problem is that once it gets to be that thick, you're at the kind of higher end on your spectrophotometer. But in theory, you could, if you could just keep blasting in on a single cell, right? But what we find when we measure it in the ocean with technology that doesn't allow us to do that is this. So this is from a very old paper by Morell and Burkow where they actually looked at that, they actually modeled this. And they said, okay, well, let's take a small cell and we'll measure its absorption spectrum. And they measured this spectrum, which has got a nice peak, both, both, both peaks due to chlorophyll. And then if you had a large cell of the same internal concentration, obviously more pigment because it's a bigger cell, but the same internal concentration, the same absorption, the same cellular absorption coefficient of this material. You've got this peak, and you can see that, in fact, it is flattened. Right? Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't the because it's normalized to it, well, so what we did, when by normalizing it, we just put them all on the same scale. It doesn't change, it changes, the shape is, the change is, is true. Yes, this one would have a higher absorption because it's a bigger cell. So we could put them on a different scale, and it would look like this. Um, if it's just regular absorption, it would be like this. The other one would look something like something low. Right, because this one has lower absorption compared to that. But the shape change is caused by what we call packaging. The fact that there's so much, there's such a long path length for these photons to go through that some of the photons, some of the pigments over here actually never really see the light. Right, they're shaded. Right. Okay, and so that gets us back to this diagram that I showed, or, or graph that I showed you from yesterday, where we looked at the blue to red peak and found that the blue to red peak is really different for the small cell versus the large cell. Okay. So this is what we call a global relationship. This, well, this is like the Northern European waters, but you can find this everywhere. Um, this, is, this was for um, global relationships. But what we tend to see is if the environment can be characterized by oligotrophic conditions, which are low chlorophyll waters, right? what do we know about oligotrophic conditions? What does that mean, oligotrophic? Low nutrients. Who do we tend to see in terms of phytoplankton in low nutrient waters? Cyanobacteria, small cells, right? So we tend to see these cells in these environments with this spectrum. And when we're in eutrophic environments, lots of nutrients, we tend to have a lot of biomass because biomass is set by the, the limit of nutrients, right? We, um, and so the more nutrients we have, the more potential growth and the, lar the, the larger the concentration of chlorophyll in those waters. And who tends to live in eutrophic environments? Diatoms, my favorite, right? 
So those are the small cells, those are the big cells, and the diatoms have the flattened slope. They're bigger. I mean, we can make some arguments about who's got what internal concentration, but to first order, the size of the cells is controlled by the nutrient environment, which controls the biomass of the environment, which controls the absorption spectrum of the environment. So to first order, we can make these sorts of interpretations when we look at spectral absorption. And so the shape of spectral absorption can tell you an awful lot about who's in the water. Now, one thing that I would like to be very clear on is that you can also find eutrophic environments with small cells. And anyone who spent any time in Long Island or in the Gulf Coast of Texas with Oreococcus blooms, Oreococcus is a very small phytoplankton, two microns, it blooms to tremendous concentrations. But if you measure the absorption coefficient of those cells, it looks more like this one because it's a small cell. But it's in a high biomass environment. So you have to be very careful. You can also have diatoms living in low nutrient environments, like after they've used them all up, right? So a eutrophic system where the nutrients are all used up can have relatively low concentrations of large cells. So this is a global relationship with a lot of spread, and that spread is ecology. Oh, yeah. So there's the same cell with different pigment concentrations. Whoa. But that didn't show up as pr nearly as pretty as it does on my screen. But you can have this large cells with low internal concentration or high con internal concentration, and you will get the change. So this would tell you something about what? Low versus high internal concentration. What about the cells? Yeah. They could, this could be light limited, and this one that you can't see definitely has plenty, <laughs> plenty of light. It didn't put on very much pigment. And so within large phytoplankton, for example, if you look at the shape of the absorption spectrum, that can tell you something about their light history. So, very powerful tool. Okay, questions on pigment packaging? Yeah. Well, which do you think? So if we had relatively low pigment, what is the, what is the decrease in amplitude? Yeah, so there'd be less, less absorption, so nice tight peaks, because you can resolve the differences between small amounts of absorption when most of the light is getting through the cell. And when you can't, when you have a cell that's packed with pigment, it's very difficult to resolve what might be the difference in a pigment absorption because almost all the light is being attenuated through that cell anyway. <coughs> yes. Can you go yes. So, which one is um, environments that have low nutrients, oligotrophic waters, uh, when there's not that many nutrients in the water, um, cells that have a competitive advantage are cells that have, well, let's think about it this way. If you have a cell, you have some surface area. And you have some cell volume. Right? So the surface area of a sphere is something r squared, right? I teach college, so these are things that I just remember all the time. Right? And what's the volume of a sphere? Four thirds pi r cubed. So cells get their nutrients through the surface. 
right? Diffusion, maybe some active transport, depending upon what. So this is, that's what controls how they can make a living, right? But this is what they have to support, right? So you, ha you can only grow your cell if you have some surface area through which to absorb. And if you have really low nutrients out here, say nitrate, um, you have, and if you look at small cells versus large cells, which has the biggest surface area per volume? Small cells. They don't have very much volume compared to their surface area, so they have a competitive advantage in low nutrient environments. Big cells have a lot of volume to support, but they if you live in a nutrient-enriched environment, you can store it. And often what diatoms do is they, when the, say there's an upwelling event, they suck up all the nitrogen, whatever else they need, and they can store it and then kind of use it later. And so they have a great capacity in patchy, high-nutrient environments. Small cells have an advantage in oligotrophic environments. And so that's why we tend to see small cells in oligotrophic environments. And because they're oligotrophic and they don't have much nitrogen around, um, their yield tends to be low, or the concentration of biomass tends to be low. In environments that have high nutrients, the yield is high. Because if the, you have some physical event that brings a lot of nutrients in the water, then that is your potential for all that nitrogen to end up as cellular nitrogen. Does that answer your question? Small cell, large cell, small cell, large cell. Because you get this flattened peaks. See how flat that is? This has nice peakiness. Also a very big difference. So if we go back to this, pic this image here. Um, which one do I want to do? Oh, well, we'll have to sketch this. Oh wait, that's it. Small or larger. For the same material, you would have very little light coming out of the larger cell. And so if this was blue light, and then you did blue light plus two nanometers, you wouldn't see a big difference. And so that makes the peak, instead of being nice and peaked and being able to see very small differences in the amount of light coming out, you wouldn't be able to see very much difference. And so your absorption tends to flatten out. You can't resolve that peak because of the large size and the strong absorption within the cell. So big cells have flattened peaks. Okay, good. Okay. All right, so we're gonna measure absorption today. Somebody has collected you a bunch of water, filtered it, and you have the filtrate, and you have the particles on the filter. The filter they used did not look like this. That's for later. <laughs> but you're gonna get this water today. Okay. So filtration is a great way to separate CDOM from particles. Um, the other thing is that it also, um, in the ocean, it tends to be relatively dilute. And so by filtering particles onto this filter, when you're ready to measure this, it's helpful because it's concentrated all your absorbing material. So you can get a nice strong signal. Okay, so. Spectrophotometers output absorbents. And we've been talking about absorbents. Absorbents, which is now the unbolded A in my vocabulary. Um, is different. So this was the absorbtense, which was the ratio of absorbed to incident. Absorbance is the log base 10 value of the incident light over the transmitted light, by definition. It's related to absorbtense this way. You can do the math in here. It's just like playing with logarithms. So when we get numbers out of the spectrophotometer today, um, this is what you're gonna get, this value. And that is sometimes called optical density. So you'll see in a lot of literature, 
um, they'll talk about the optical density of the signature out of a spectrophotometer. Um, optical density just says it's transmitted, right? So if there's scattering in there, it's all included. But if there's no scattering, then um, this optical density is due just to absorbance. All right, so we're going to put our sample in. There's going to be some path length of our sample. We're going to have incident light, transmitted light. The magic happens in, and we get a number. If we're interested in the materials dissolved in the water sample, or the ocean sample that we have, we want to remove water and see, or we want to reference out the water so that we can see what the absorption by that component is, right? And we do that by measuring the reference material, and we call it a baseline correction. So you put in water first, you take a measurement, then you put your sample in, and you get the absorbance of the sample minus that reference already subtracted for you. It also removes all of the instrument signals, which is important because instruments have a lot of signals that you're not interested in. So we can look at this as being the, this term, the absorbance for your sample, absorbance for the reference. Luckily, we know something about logarithms, and we get out this, um, this term. So if you want, we could read derive, but we can derive the equation that relates absorption to absorbance. And because absorption is in a natural log, and absorbance is in log base 10, we have to scale those out. And it turns out the natural log of 10 is 2.303 times the absorbance divided by the path length. So that's where the 2.303 comes from. It's just this conversion from natural to log base 10. And our path length is the path length of our cuvette. Okay. And it's in meters because absorption has units of per meter. Loss of light due to absorption per meter of, of sample. All right, so it's not an infinitesimally small layer. Um, so we have to think about that. And we will actually have samples for which we want to have a much longer path length, because maybe one centimeter isn't big enough to get good signal. Um, the rule of thumb for spectrophotometry is that you want your absorbance to be somewhere between 0.1 and 0.4 to obey the inf infinitesimally thin criteria by which you have basically single scattering events or sort of single absorption events. You want things dilute enough. And that actually means that your transmission is on the order of 40 to 80 percent transmission. Okay. You want a signal, <laughs> but you don't want too much signal. So when you have a spectrum of CDOM, that looks like this, you may find that your optical density to stay within this range, you may actually have to sort of divide it up and do maybe a one centimeter path here and a 10 centimeter path here. So to stay within these criteria so that you're not self-shading your sample, you may have to measure your sample twice if you're interested in both parts of the spectrum. But that's okay, because you'll learn how to do that today. Okay. All right. So, particles on filters. How many people have measured particles on filters in the spectrophotometer? One, two, three. Oh, yay. All right. So that's where we're headed next. Any questions? this? Okay, straightforward. All right, so the current state of the art recommended way of measuring the absorption by particles on filters is in a center mounted integrating sphere. The problem is that those filters are made of glass fibers and those glass fibers are very scattering and you can tell that because when you look at them they're white. Right? which means they're scattering all the light equally back to your eye. 
And you know that when you filter, if you look at it under the microscope, you can see all the particles embedded. These are fibers. They're laid down in a way to give a nominal pore size of 0.7 microns. And the cells and particles get sort of embedded in there. And so you can imagine if there's all this scattering going on, it's creating a different kind of light environment that isn't anything like what we've talked about. Right. And what we want to do is capture all of that scattered light. Because if we don't, we're attributing scattered light to absorption. And you're going to overestimate the absorption. And so by having an integrating sphere that's made of spectralon so that it's intentionally scattering in the interior, then you can actually capture that scattered light. Okay. So the instrument that we'll be using is a dual beam spectrophotometer. It has a sample and a reference beam. And the reason why that is good is because it's constantly accounting for the variations in the light source. Light sources are not stable. And so having the two beams being constantly measured is really critical. Um, single beam, you just have an assumption that your lamp hasn't changed over time. And sometimes that's not a great assumption. So there's some like giant instrument over here that has a light source. It splits the beam. One beam comes in and hits a mirror and enters in through a port. We're looking down on this integrating sphere. Excuse me, down on the integrating sphere. And there's going to be a little opening in that sphere where there's a detector. But essentially the whole thing is relatively close. So you set it up so that that sample beam comes and goes through your filter first. It doesn't interact with anything here, it's air. And it goes through the sample. And what's going to happen to it? It's absorbed some scattering and then that bit meme will exit right and so now this has been reduced due to absorption it also probably is spread out in a lot of different directions but I'm going to show you how that happens so instead of just going out otherwise we could detect it here and say yay we have absorption but it's going to be scattering out of here but once it hits this wall what's going to happen this wall is white spectral on it's going to reflect it's going to reflect like that right so it will reflect like this and then we'll just imagine we've got like some part of the light headed this way and then this is going to reflect some of this is going to go through the sample again and you can just imagine it just creates this incredible um, field oh being inside an integrating sphere would actually be very cool that might be my alternate universe just for a few minutes although it's really bright so this whole thing will fill with light and there'll be multiple passes through this filter so we're going to get a really strong absorption but we've passed through it multiple times. Okay, so then we've got this reference beam. So the reference beam comes in and slides past without interacting with the filter at all. And what's going to happen to it? It's going to reflect, right? So we get multiple scattering by that. Now, the beauty of these instruments is like sample, reference, sample, reference, sample, reference. So it's constantly taking account for each wavelength what's happening in here. And so what happens is this is all going to spread and spread this way. Each one of these, so the whole thing will fill with light and it will pass through this filter multiple times. But what's the difference between those two measurements? The first pass, right? So that's the beauty, is that the sample beam signal minus the reference beam signal, the difference between them is the single pass. So we have our little detector over here, and so it's measuring the amount of light that is attenuated. Okay. Excellent. So the absorption, 2.303 times your measured optical density over the path length. But what is our path length? Well, if we have a volume of water, that we're filtering, right? And we take that volume of water and we're filtering it through a filter that looks like this. We've taken that volume and essentially created a cylinder of water, the volume of which equals the volume of your sample. So you just have to figure out what the height is of that column, and that is essentially the path length 
in the spectrophotometer. I know, right? It's so cool. And not convinced, are you? I know. But essentially, you've taken all the, we'll use your bottle. You take all the water in here and all the particles that are in here, and you filter them onto a filter that has an area, pi r squared. But all of those particles, which we've now spread out on the layer, we could back them back into the volume in a tube. And that's what we're looking through. And so the volume of that cylinder is equal to the volume of your sample water. But the size of the cylinder depends upon your filter cut. Okay. So the volume of a cylinder is, well, I probably didn't put it up here, um, pi r squared h, right? So volume of the sample filtered. that's what you filtered, has to equal pi r squared h, which is the volume of the cylinder of water. r is the radius of the effective filter circle. There's your filter. That's where all your green stuff is. That's your radius. The light beam has to be bigger than that, so the light beam actually ends up being something like this, which is why we have to take into account the total amount of material went to this area. So, and this height here is your path length. And you only sample through part of it, but that's okay. Because it does, you could have sampled a little bit further over, a little bit further. So, if we solve for h, we find that h equals the volume filtered over pi r squared. And that is the geometric path length of your sample. So now, where I have this equation for absorption divided by path length, I just have to put this in for the path length. We typically measure volume in mils, cubic centimeters. The filters are small. We measure the radius in centimeters. The ones that I use, the filter cup that I have is 1.1 centimeter. We'll measure whatever yours are. And so then you have um, cubic centimeters over square centimeters. So this is per centimeter. So we have to have a conversion to get us to meters. That's where the 100 comes in. Okay, there's one more thing we have to do. If this wasn't such a great measurement, <laughs> we wouldn't do it because it's a pain. But um, one of the problems is that um, the first measurement we make, we put in a blank filter pad so we can get our reference, right? We have to do that. Um, so that's subtracted, and so the properties of the filter pad turn out to be, it's got a really high optical density. We can talk later about how much light actually is making it through that filter. Um, but we have to remove that because as white it is as it is, it isn't perfectly white. And so it has a spectrum to it that we have to remove. But the problem is, the thing that we love about glass fiber filters is that they create a really strong signal by multiply scattering light through the sample, the problem is they create this highly diffuse light field that scatters through multiple times. And so this multiple scattering increases the probability that any photon is going to be absorbed. And we were only supposed to give it one shot through. And there are going to be multiple shot opportunities for absorption. 
And so what that would do is lead to this overestimation of absorption because we've enhanced the optical path length. We have the geometric path length through the water, but now we've compressed it and there's like multiple 